Greetings and welcome to this evening's Colorado Law Talk. My name is Georgette Vigil. I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement and Outreach at Colorado Law. We are happy that you are here. During this presentation, you can ask questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be monitored as they are submitted. Professor Douglas Spencer will respond to questions following the presentation. This Colorado Law Talk is a webinar, therefore only panelists can activate their video and microphone. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize that the University of Colorado sits upon land within the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples territories. Further, we acknowledge that 48 contemporary tribal nations are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. I'm excited to introduce Lolita Buckner Innes, Dean of the University of Colorado Law School and Provost Professor of Law. Before coming to Colorado Law, she served as the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and as a Professor of Law at SMU Dedman School of Law, a highly regarded scholar with prominent national and international with a prominent national and international voice in her fields, Dean Innes is an elected member of the American, the American Law Institute and its United States Special Repertoire to the International Academy of Comparative Law on Contemporary Slavery. Dean Innes has received her AB from Princeton University where she majored in Romance Languages and Literature with certifications and minors in African American and Latin American studies. She earned her JD from UCLA, where she was an editor of the National Black Law Journal and Moot Court Honors participant. In addition, she holds an LLM with distinction and a PhD in law from Osgood Hall Law School, York University in Canada. Please join me in welcoming Dean Ennis. Thank you so very much uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, I am delighted to be here today, uh, or I should say tonight, uh, unless you are in a very far time zone uh, for uh, our presentation. Uh, we will be hearing tonight from Professor Douglas Spencer, who will be speaking on the topic, why do people lack power in a democracy? Colorado Law's mission includes uh, incident, uh, events like this. That is to say, engaging and compelling research, exceptional legal education, and influential programming with profound impact in the real world, as well as in the scholarly world. I wanna tell you a little bit about tonight's speaker. Professor Douglas Spencer worked as an expert witness in voting rights and campaign finance cases and Prior to teaching law, he was a law clerk at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in San Francisco, an election monitor in Thailand for the Asian Network for Free Elections, and a researcher for the Pew Center on the States, Military, and, he, and Overseas Voting Reform Project. Professor Spencer holds a PhD in jurisprudence and social policy from the University of California, Berkeley. He also earned a JD at Berkeley Law and a master's in public policy at the Goldman School of Public Policy also at UC Berkeley. He graduated magna cum laude from Columbia University in 2004 with a BA in philosophy. Professor Spencer is an example um, of one of the wonderful professors here at Colorado Law. And professors like uh, Pro Professor Spencer help to ensure that our graduates go on to meaningful public service work and private work, which directly benefits communities and society. This series, was started in 2017 to share some of that research and to share the kind of programming, the kind of teaching that our students are fortunate enough to have. What we will be hearing tonight is just one small example of the kind of excellent programming that is consistently available here at our institution. And so uh, before starting and turning us over to Professor Spencer, I just want to point out that you can learn more about his work and his background at the detail, uh, in the detailed biography that was uh, emailed to you. 
I'm now going to turn the program over to Professor Spencer, um, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Thank you so much, Professor Spencer. Thank you, Dean Ennis. I really appreciate um, that introduction. I appreciate the chance to be here today and to talk to all of you. I see a few familiar names on the panel, on the uh, attendee list. So I just want to say hi to those of you who are students of mine or people that I know from Colorado. I'm relatively new to Colorado, and I've really enjoyed to get to know everybody here in this community. I can second what Dean Innes says about the amazing intellectual community that the faculty and the students have here at the law school. And I'm thrilled for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my research. The topic for today is thinking about why people lack power in a democracy. Um, but I really want to focus, that's a question that has uh, dozens and dozens of answers. And I want to focus on some of the things that I've been studying and writing about that relates to that question in terms of different ways that we're seeing people's uh, rights be marginalized in recent years in ways that maybe we haven't seen in prior years. I am gonna show a couple of slides. I don't have uh, a large number of slides, but um, if you'll just bear with me for one moment while I pull this up. All right, I hope that's visible to you and then you can still see me if you care, but uh, I'll be off to the side on, on, your, on the side of your screen. Um, why do people lack power in a democracy? Well, in part, the answer is really simple. And that is that our constitution, despite being written under the auspices of we the people, doesn't provide a very robust protection of people's right to vote or right to participate. Article two or Article one, section two, says that the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. This is the statement in the Constitution of 1789 that tells us who has the right to vote. Uh, the right to vote was not defined in the federal constitution, but power was given to each individual state to make that determination. And the federal constitution said that it would recognize people who had the right to vote for the state house of representatives in each individual state. As we all know, the states at that time limited voting in really important ways, not important in a good way, but in uh, meaningful and deleterious ways. Adult white male property owners essentially uh, held the right to vote at the founding of our country. Now you can imagine the history of voting rights in the United States would be vastly different if at the founding voting rights were considered a fundamental and universal right, and that we had slowly scaled back that voting rights when we had good reasons to. Perhaps we don't want six month old babies with the right to vote or people with dementia or people in prisons, or perhaps we do. But those scaling back of voting rights would need to be justified. As it turns out, the franchise has worked in the exact opposite direction. So the, the ability to vote under the US Constitution was quite limited. And we've had to fight tooth and nail to expand that definition of the right to vote over many, many years. Um, an amendment, uh, the 14th Amendment, Section 2, is, an, is a portion of an amendment that maybe you're not 100% uh, familiar with. Section one of the 14th Amendment has the due process clause and the equal protection clause. But in section two of the 14th Amendment, and this was ratified in 1868 in the wake of the Civil War. Uh, and the goal of the 14th Amendment was to resolve and to reconstruct the United States as the country was coming back together. Um, and states were told that they could not deny people the right to vote or else they would lose representation in Congress because there was concern that despite the end of the Civil War, states in the South that had been former slave states would continue to discriminate uh, against black voters and prevent them from voting. And there's a punishment that if you do that, then you'll lose your representation in Congress. But there's this phrase in section two of the 14th Amendment that says when the right to vote is denied or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion or other crime. Now, the idea, of course, was to prevent uh, the expansion of the right to vote to people who are hostile to the United States. But I raise this because this is a clause in the US Constitution that the Supreme Court has looked at since 1974 to justify felon disenfranchisement. If states want to ban people from voting because they've convicted, been convicted of a felony, either currently serving in prison, on parole, on probation, or even in some cases after that, the Supreme Court has said that's okay, despite strong evidence that there's racial disparities, despite strong evidence that um, this isn't the original intent of the 14th Amendment Section 2, that this language further limits voting rights. So in many ways, the US Constitution 
actually limits voting rights more than it expands voting rights. And that's really, I guess, the most simple answer to why we lack power in a democracy, but we've been trying to fight against this in many ways. Now, since 1868, the Constitution has recognized some protections for voting rights. So you'll notice in the 15th Amendment, which was ratified in 1870, and the 19th Amendment, which was ratified in 1920, the 26th Amendment that was ratified in 1971, the Constitution bars discrimination based on three categories, race, gender, and age. This is really a protection against disparate treatment. It says nothing about the burden on the rights to vote. And thus, if a state legislature or a city council or Congress wants to burden people's right to vote, and they can convince you that they're burdening everybody's right to vote, then that's not covered by the 15th or the 19th or the 26th Amendment, which really looks at disparate treatment and the limited view that our Supreme Court has about that. Which brings me to the Supreme Court. Now, the Constitution does not explicitly protect the right to vote. It does not say that it's fundamental. However, for those who've taken constitutional law, you'll know that there's a lot of things that the Constitution does not protect or explicitly identify as a fundamental right. And yet the Supreme Court has identified some of these rights as fundamental to who we are. These may be rights to our physical autonomy, the right to raise kids the way that we want, the right to make medical decisions about ourselves, the right to an abortion. These are rights that aren't explicitly in the Constitution. And yet the Supreme Court has read them to be fundamental. And for a good chunk of the United States history, the Supreme Court used very powerful rhetoric to define voting as a fundamental right under the Constitution. Here's language from a case in 1886 in a case called Yikwo versus Hopkins that wasn't directly about voting rights, but it touched on the political power of Chinese citizens in San Francisco. And it says, there are many illustrations that might be given of this truth, which would make manifest that it is self-evident in the light of our system of ju jurisprudence. The case of the political franchise of voting is one, though not regarded strictly as a natural right, but as a privilege merely conceded by society according to its will under certain conditions. Nevertheless, it is regarded as a fundamental political right because it is preservative of all rights. This is really powerful language. This is language that Democrats have been using in recent weeks to push for voting rights legislation in Congress, saying, who cares about an infrastructure bill? Who cares about a tax bill? If we don't protect voting rights, none of those things really matter. All of those rights flow from our fundamental right to vote, to be heard, to be represented. But 1886 was a long time ago. And the Supreme Court today doesn't hold such a high view of the fundamental right to vote. In a Supreme Court case just last year, Brnovich versus DNC, a case out of Arizona, in the majority opinion authored by Justice Alito, Justice Alito writes, because voting necessarily requires some effort and compliance with some rules, the concept of a voting system that is, quote, equally open and that furnishes an equal opportunity to cast a ballot must tolerate the usual burdens of voting. Mere inconvenience cannot be enough to demonstrate a violation of section two, that being section two of the Voting Rights Act. Then he drops a footnote. There's a difference between openness and opportunity on the one hand and the absence of inconvenience on the other. For example, suppose that an exhibit at a museum in a particular city is open to everyone free of charge every day of the week for several months. Some residents of the city who have the opportunity to view the exhibit may find it inconvenient to do so for many reasons. The problem of finding parking, dislike of public transportation, anticipation that the exhibit will be crowded, a plethora of weekend chores and obligations, et cetera. Or to take another example, a college course may be open to all students and all may have the opportunity to enroll, but some students may find it inconvenient to take the class for a variety of reasons. It may occur too early in the morning, it may occur on Friday afternoons, it may require too much reading, the professor may be a jerk. Now, I'm gonna set aside for the moment the fact that Justice Alito thinks voting is akin to going to a museum. I think that speaks a little bit to the life experience that he has and the way that he views the world. And I just wanna point out that I think on the one hand, this is a very fair assessment of a right in the United States and the way that we exercise our rights. Citizens of the United States need to be tough. We need to buck up. We need to go down and exercise some effort if we're gonna cast our right to vote. If those same inconveniences are tolerated for other kinds of fundamental rights. But that's not the case. We've seen just in the last two years, the Supreme Court strike down laws and very 
vociferously argue that inconveniences when it comes to gun ownership or inconveniences when it comes to the free exercise of religion, for example, wearing a mask in a church, are completely unacceptable. They infringe on a fundamental right. And I wonder what makes voting so different? What makes voting rights less worthy of those kinds of protections? If you want Americans to be tough and to fight for our rights, then say so, and we should do so across the board. If you think some rights are fundamental and be protected, then they should all be protected. But to split rights in this way, and particularly if we think that voting rights are preservative of all other rights, including gun rights, including the right to exercise your own religion, then if anything, I think the protection of voting rights should be even stronger if there is to be a deviation and not consistency across the board. But today we don't have a Supreme Court that interprets voting rights very strongly, uh, and that's disappointing to me. And I think that it results in people losing power in a democracy because their, rights to, their right to vote has been infringed in some way and there's no protection in courts. Now, of course, we only need to rely on the Supreme Court if our rights have been infringed in some way. If there were a strong protection of our rights through the political process, perhaps all of this uh, exegesis of the 1789 constitution and these uh, century old Supreme Court cases may be irrelevant or at least be less important. And so what do we know about what's happening in the sphere of public policy? A lot of things are happening in the sphere of public policy and I wanna focus on one because it's something that I've been doing some research on. So it helps, hopefully you learn a little bit more about me as a scholar and a little bit more about uh, how our public policy makers have been approaching voting rights. Um, this last year, COVID-19 created a huge disruption to the American election system. Uh, COVID was declared a national emergency right in the middle of a national primary system. Some states delayed their primary elections, some states held their primary elections, some adopted mail-in voting, uh, and they were doing so on the fly. Now, a, a project that I'm working on with some public health scholars uh, and some law professors and a statistician. We have together an index that identifies the risk factors that contribute to COVID-19 mortality and morbidity. This is different than other indices that you may have seen online. This is not an index that predicts where COVID will break out or who's likely to get COVID. What this index shows is if in a community, COVID uh, visits the borders and starts to infect people in that community, then it's much more likely people in those communities are gonna die or have serious impacts. And in fact, we look at deaths, either as a percent of the overall population or as a percent of people who test positive. And there are a multitude of uh, predicting and comorbidities that go into COVID-19 mortality. And we look at them, dozens and dozens of comorbidities to COVID-19. And we use statistical models to identify what is the strongest predictor of COVID-19 risk in any individual county in the United States among all 3,033 counties? And this map identifies the top three and then the dark green category is kind of all of the other um, 17, I believe, in this particular model. And you'll see there are different primary uh, contributors to COVID-19 mortality geographically dispersed in certain parts of the United States. In New England, in the northern, the northern Midwestern states, we see that old age, being 65 years or older is the leading cause of COVID-19 death. In many of the Southern states, racial minority status, this is being non-white, is the strongest predictor of COVID-19 mortality. And then in some counties, it's the kind of work that's done, the employment opportunities uh, and the economy where their essential workers are losing their lives because of COVID-19. And I wanna zoom in on Texas for a minute. So here is a count, the, here are his a county map of Texas. And it's two different measures, but they're very similar. They're both predictions of COVID fatality rates based on past fatality rates, a model, a statistical predictive model of comorbidities with COVID-19. On the left, the denominator is people who test positive, And on the right, the denominator is population. But the numerator is always the likelihood that people will die, COVID-19. And you can see in Texas, most counties, the primary predictor of COVID-19 mortality is belonging to a minority race. And some of these counties are crosshatched. They have these lines in them. Um, if you'll, this map that I had before identifies the counties that are in the top 10 riskiest counties where death is the most likely in the United States 
Texas has quite a few of these at-risk counties that are in the top 10 for the entire United States. And a lot of them are in the southwestern corner along the Rio Grande. Not all of them, but many of them. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because Texas made a policy decision when it came to administering their elections. They said, if you're over the age of 65, you can cast a mail-in ballot. If you belong to another vulnerable community, for example, if you are a racial minority, you're not allowed to use a mail-in ballot, despite pleas, lawsuits, uh, and, and social organization um, and community organizing. That was a policy choice. It had real impacts. Now we can look and we can say, where are the counties where race was the predominant factor? And we'll see on the, you know, the lower left part of these maps. What if we superimpose onto these maps the partisanship of voters who live in these counties? And you'll see that politicians in Texas were making a partisan calculation. They were making a decision that they wanted people who were over the age of 65 to vote easily and not be deterred because of COVID-19 because they predicted that they were more likely to be Republican. But they weren't so excited about extending voting rights to racial minority groups in southwestern Texas because, well, they predicted that they would vote for Democrats. And in essence, what they were asking people who lived in these counties was, you can risk your life to cast a ballot, or you can stay home. And what's miraculous is that in the United States, turnout in the 2020 election was at an all-time, almost an all-time high the highest rate in 108 years, in fact, the second highest turnout rate ever. And yet in these counties along the Rio Grande, turnout went down. And so we see actual voter suppression, not so openly practiced, but in a very clever way, if you wanna think about it like that, focused on partisanship, not focused on expanding the right to votes and with an unfortunate, but I don't think accidental racial component as well. So it's not that we can rely on our public policymakers to expand the franchise and protect the rights to vote. Sometimes we may need the courts to step in where policymakers are not extending that franchise. Another area that we're seeing in the midst right now is redistricting. And I just have a snapshot here of a website that I run called All About Redistricting. The website tracks all of the maps that are being released in every state for Congress and state legislative districts. I'm tracking litigation in all the states where litigation has been filed where courts may draw the lines again. There's references to all of the criteria that each state must follow, the bodies that draw these districts, the parties that are in control of drawing the districts, and conversations about efforts for reform. There's actions to watch that you can follow. And there's a lot happening right now where politicians, and in some cases, independent commissions like we have in Colorado are drawing districts and choosing who's gonna be voting in which districts. And again, let me just highlight Texas for a minute. I don't mean to pick on Texas, but when you see a problem, you've just got to talk about the problem. Texas had remarkable population growth between 2010 and 2020. Seven states lost a congressional seat and only six states gained a congressional seat because Texas actually gained two congressional seats in 2020 because of their population growth. According to the census, 95% of that growth between 2010 and 2020 was from non-white individuals, people who either checked the box on the census for not being white or for being more than one race, 95% of that growth. So you might expect Texas got two new seats, 95% of that growth that gave them two seats was from minority populations. Probably those two new districts should be very favorable for minority voting interests. Well, that's not the case. As it turns out, uh, not only did Texas fail to increase the number of uh, minority opportunity districts, they didn't even hold constant the number of minority opportunity districts in Texas. Under the old scheme, there were eight majority Latino districts and one majority black district. In their current proposed plan that has been approved by the legislature uh, and soon to be signed by Governor Abbott, there's only seven majority Hispanic seats, not eight. There's zero majority black districts, not one and the number of majority white districts increased from 22 to 23. So this is an instance where not only are people's uh, rights being stripped in terms of what, how they'll be represented at their state legislature and in Congress, but it's done so in the face of uh, growth and in the face of obvious um, minority political clout growing in the state. Um, and so redistricting is another way in which legislators and even commissions can say, we're not, well, anyone can show up to vote. 
we're not going to pass voter ID laws. There's no voter registration. We can make voting as easy as possible. But once you've cast your ballot, we're going to draw districts in such a way that your, your vote doesn't matter anymore. So people's rights are being diluted, not necessarily denied because they're able to vote, but they're being diluted. And this is yet another way that we've seen the rights of people, particularly racial and ethnic minorities, but the rights of people uh, deprived from participation, even in the country that we hail as the greatest democracy on earth. Now, finally, I wanna say something about American politics uh, before I pause and take uh, some questions. There's been a persistent wealth gap in the United States since at least the 1960s. The census has been asking people about their, uh, whether they turned out and mapping that onto wealth and reporting that since 1964. And the wealth gap's been persistent at about 20 to 30%, but it's been increasing in recent years. And I've been involved in research to try to figure out why. Not necessarily why there's been a persistent gap, but why it's increased in recent years. This is just a map since 2008. You can see people who make less than $20,000 are turning out at 20 to 30% less uh, lower rates than people who make over $100,000 per year, according to the current population survey, which is a product of the United States Census Bureau. Now, voter registration is a policy that makes it difficult to vote and that disproportionately falls on the poor. You need to have access to information and the internet to find out what day your voter registration ends. I challenge those of you who are listening on this call, if you know the day that voter registration ends in Colorado for you to vote or the home state where you come from. Some of you may, some of you may be from states with uh, election day registration, but it requires information. And we know that that information burden falls disproportionately on the poor. But voter registration still only accounts for about half of the wealth gap that we see in voting. You can see that the gap among the total population, the percent who voted is 33%. Now, once you account for people who are registered to vote, there's a gap. There's still a 20% gap between the wealthiest and the poorest among people who had the resources and the means and the ability to register to vote. But it shrinks quite considerably. So voter registration is one area in which our public policy has increased the wealth gap in the United States in terms of turnout. But it, it's not the whole story. There's been a lot of commentary about voter ID laws. Voter ID laws aren't actually contributing as much to this gap as you may think. Here is a plot that shows the percent turnout um, across five equally sized income quintiles. Now, let me explain what this graph is saying. Each of these categories, people who make less than $20,000, which is about a fifth of the population, people who make 20 to $30,000 a year, which is about a fifth of the population, people who make 30 to 50,000, 50 to 70, and above $70,000. Each of these groups represents a fifth of the United States. And so if there was equality in voting, each of these groups would represent about 20% of the electorate. But we can see that people who are poor represent 21% less turnout than we would expect if there was equality in voting. And people who are wealthy and earn more than $70,000 per year turn out about 15% more than we would expect if there is equality in voting. But here's the thing, if you look at the dark and the light bars, this plot is separated out by states that either have a strict voter ID law or no strict voter ID law. And you can see that there are differences in both sets of states, that voter ID law, in fact, there's a bigger gap in the states that don't have voter ID laws than there is between states with a voter ID law. And so as much ink has been spilt and consternation that there has been about the effects of voter ID laws, and they certainly have important expressive uh, effects in terms of telling particular communities, you don't belong in our political you're not part of our political community. Uh, we don't see you. We don't want you to participate. Those expressive harms are real. But in terms of actual impacts on turnout, it's, it turns out that voter ID laws have not had the giant voter suppression impact that uh, you may have heard about in popular press or that the parties talk about when they uh, are debating these laws. They particularly have not contributed to the wealth gap in voting in a way that you might expect. So then, what does contribute to the wealth gap in voting? Well, I argue and have shown of some evidence that the way that campaigns contact voters has had a big impact. Let me show you what I mean. This is a figure that was released by a private data firm called Catalyst LLC. Catalyst is a firm that houses a whole bunch of credit data, 
uh, and consumer data. So they merge uh, data sets from Visa and they're able to buy data sets from Target and they buy data sets from United Airlines. And then they merge them into these enormous data sets um, at where each row is a single individual. So they know about individuals. They know whether you traveled out of the country, they know what your, your elite status is on your airlines, what kind of computer you use, a Mac or a PC. They know if you have a pet, they know where you spend your purchases. And Catalyst took that data set and matched it to the voter file. The voter file is a public record. It doesn't say who you voted for, of course, because your ballot is secret, but there is a record of whether you voted. And so Catalyst was a firm that decided it was going to create a political data set where political data was matched to consumer data and sell it to campaigns. And so this was a plot that Catalyst has projected about what, it data can show, what, what its data can show us. This is a contact map for John Kerry's campaign in Ohio in 2004. Green means that the Kerry campaign contacted this group many, many times. Red means they contacted the group or individual fewer times and yellow somewhere in between. Each pixel on this map essentially represents one person. And along the x-axis, people who are further to the left are more likely to be Republican, registered Republican or predicted to be Republican in this data set. People who are further to the right are more likely to be Democratic. And then the model also can look, they know whether you voted in the past and they know a whole bunch of information about you. And they predict whether you're going to turn out or not. People near the top of the figure are unlikely to turn out to vote and people at the bottom of the figure are likely to turn out. Now, importantly, the Kerry campaign did not have access to these data. These data were created after 2004, looking back at their data set. But we can see that the Kerry campaign had a pretty good sense of who was a Democrat and who wasn't. And that their strategy was, let's go contact a whole bunch of Democrats. They're on the far right of that plot, a whole bunch of green. We know who you are gonna to try to turn you out. And otherwise there's not really a lot of patterns. Um, there's just a, a, a concerted effort to contact people who are Democratic, maybe some idea that people who are Republican and not likely to turn out weren't worth contacting if you could predict that. So you see some red in that top left corner. But let's fast forward to 2012. Catalyst became famous because the Obama campaign purchased their data and won a presidential election in 2008 using a, uh, a strategy called micro-targeting, where they, instead of using zip code data about who's Democratic or who's Republican, they knew which households to contact in each neighborhood. So their canvassers would go around the neighborhood with an app and they'd say, oh, we're not gonna contact that house because our app tells us that that's probably not a Republican or somebody who's not likely to turn out. And so this micro-targeting strategy uh, led campaigns to be more efficient. Well, what does more efficient mean? Well, let's take a look. Here's the map in 2012. And we can see a few trends appearing. One, the Obama campaign was focused on mobilization. Here are Democrats who are more likely, who are highly likely to turn out, or Democrats in general, we're gonna get out the base. That was clearly a big strategy. Another strategy we can see is an effort at persuading likely to turn out voters who were a little bit Republican. There were efforts to reach out to them to convince them that Obama was worth voting for over Mitt Romney. But here's the striking feature of this plot. There was absolutely no contact made to individuals who a consumer database told the campaign is not likely to turn out. And I have access to this data uh, and I've analyzed it and can show you that people who are in this group are far less likely to be wealthy, uh, three to one more likely to be in uh, the poverty range. Um, there's a disproportionate amount of minority voters, but not nearly as much as there is about wealth. This is a story about ignoring the poor. Uh, and poor people who aren't mobilized by campaigns aren't gonna turn out. And that's a problem because if they don't turn out, then these models aren't going to predict they'll ever turn out in the future. In which case we get a vicious cycle where uh, poor voters don't turn out, nobody contacts them, they continue not to turn out, they continue not to be contacted and there's a perpetual problem. This is not a Supreme Court problem. This isn't even really a public policy problem. This is a problem of our political parties. This is a problem of campaigns. In American politics, we reward you as a party for winning, that's it. No party feels an obligation to be a, a good constitutional actor. No party feels an obligation to model the kind of behavior that it's going to model when it governs. 
their goal is to win. They'll be efficient. They'll ignore who they need to ignore. And they send a signal and they're making our politics worse. And so in all of these ways, when we asked, you know, why people lack power in a democracy, I'm not willing to say yet that we're not a democracy. There are senators even who've tweeted about that and said, we're not a democracy. We do believe in democratic values. We have amended our constitution to allow for the direct election of senators, to allow for ballot initiatives in some states. And I think there's a strong commitment to we the people, but there has not been a strong protection in courts. There's not been a strong commitment in our state houses. And unfortunately in our political sphere, in terms of how our political parties are run, are incentivized, are motivated, we have not created the right structure in which to incentivize them to be better actors. And all of those things contribute to a politics where many of us don't have a voice. Um, even people like me, I'm a very privileged white man and I have the right to vote. Uh, and depending on where I live, that right can be diluted in some ways. This can touch on everybody, every uh, United States citizen, despite living in a democracy. Um, so I'm gonna pause there. Hope there's some questions. Uh, look forward to engaging with you, even though I can't see you, know that I'm thinking about you. Uh, and I appreciate you all tuning in for this talk today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Spencer, uh, for that fascinating talk. Um, I, we do have, I, I've got a number of questions myself. However, I'm going to uh, go ahead and get started uh, with a question that we have in the queue. Um, and this first question is, given the problems you've identified and the current state of politics in the United States, including the current state of the Republican Party and the US Supreme Court, what is the solution to uh, the problems that you uh, are observing? Um, let me tell you how I think about this problem. I'm not sure I have a solution, but I'm very cognizant as a professor when I'm teaching students that we talk about the issues, that we call out problems when we see them, and that we follow ideas where they need to be followed. And I try to do so in an even-handed way. And it's incredibly difficult because of the national, at least political leadership of the National Republican Party. It's very difficult to keep an even-handed discussion in the classroom because uh, I would be doing a disservice to students if we didn't recognize that in this moment of time, the national leadership of the Republican Party is not committed to democratic values and not mass democracy, like everybody votes in a plebiscite for every issue, but issues like the peaceful transition of power when we run an election that we've all agreed to the rules on in advance and the failure to call out people who continue uh, either to perpetuate lies about the 2020 election or planting seeds about the 2024 election. So at least at a minimum, I would say one of the things that we can do is to call this out where we see it. And if you're a Republican, a good Republican, you need to be on the front lines calling this out and saying, this is not either what my party stands for or what I want my party to stand for. And if you're a Democrat, then you need to think long and hard about the individuals that you're alienating or welcoming into your tent. The Illinois Democratic Caucus just released its congressional redistricting plan yesterday. And they've carved up Adam Kinzinger's district to where he may no longer be able to serve in Congress. Now, I suspect that many Democrats don't like Representative Kinzinger on a number of issues, but here's a representative who has stood for truth, who's bucked his party in important ways, and the kind of person that we would need in a coalition of, of center right, center left, and progressives to fight against right-wing authoritarianism in our country. And everybody has a, a role to play in welcoming in um, people who don't support this authoritarian move. So I would say calling this out forcefully in the communities and the, and the, the, the people who listen to you is one way to do this. And the other thing I would suggest is to pay attention to what's been called the independent state legislature doctrine. And that's this idea that state legislatures have plenary authority to do whatever they want when it comes to elections. They can't be checked by their governor, they can't be checked by their state Supreme Court, and they can't be checked by federal courts. This is an argument that's gaining some teeth. Um, there's precedent against this argument, but the Supreme Court heard and kind of played with this idea during the 2020 election. This is the way that the 2024 election will undermine democracy if it goes down this route. Some state legislatures will appoint electors to the electoral college 
in contradiction to what voters in their state have voted for. And this is at least textually a plausible reading of the United States Constitution, ignoring several cases of precedent that read against the doctrine in this way. But as you start to think about what this might look like as the unraveling of democracy going forward, keeping your eyes on this particular doctrine and especially fighting hard against it if you see seeds of this in your own state legislature somewhere. We haven't seen in Colorado, but we've seen it in Arizona and New Mexico and Michigan and Pennsylvania. So it's starting to gain ground. Thank you, thank you. And we have some more questions in the queue. Uh, here's another one. How can campaigns better balance targeting individuals who will likely turn out and likely be convinced to switch their vote with targeting individuals who have a low turnout history? Yeah, we have to create new incentives for campaigns to reach out to them. I don't think that what campaigns are doing are irrational. In fact, they're doing exactly what our system is set up to do. So what does that mean? How do you incentivize people to contact uh, voters who may not be likely to turn out? Well, one is you can limit the amount of data that, that uh, is released and made publicly available for campaigns. In the past, if you didn't have fine-tuned information about every single person, and the only information you had was neighborhood level or zip code level information about the demographics and the politics of a place, then you walked into a neighborhood and talked to everybody. That meant that you might be talking to some people you don't agree with. That might mean you, you're talking to people who wouldn't be predicted to turn out. But that's what democracy is. It's engaging with each other on these issues, educating each other and learning. And so one is changing the information environment in which campaigns act. I think there are some more um, kind of front end incentives We've seen arguments made about campaign finance vouchers. Seattle's a city that's been using these. They've been introduced but not passed in other places in the country. This says you don't have to use your own money to run for office. Everybody in your city in Seattle has mailed coupons, four $25 coupons. And they can give those coupons to anyone running for office. And if I'm running for office and I go get those coupons, then I can turn them in and I get money for them. Well, that's an incentive now for me to go out and reach out to all kinds of communities. And particularly, maybe I might want to go to communities that have low turnout because I know that no other candidate's probably going to those communities. So that's a way on the front end, maybe to monetarily incentivize turnout. In a paper that I've written, that's a little bit more, I would say academic because I think that it's completely implausible, but just trying to think about ways to incentivize. There are ways that Congress could create cash grants for campaigns or a state legislature could create cash grants for campaigns who contact the most people. There's records of who people contact. And if you can turn in you know, a lottery and say, well, we contacted 300,000 people in our campaign and the other campaigns, so well, we contacted 400,000 people. The state legislature said, oh, well, we're gonna give you a million dollars then because you contacted more people. There's a way to directly incentivize you to fund your campaign by, in, by asking you to reach out to as many people as you can. Um, there are a lot of creative ways to do this. Um, but I really ultimately think it boils down to money, either the way we finance campaigns or the way we re reward candidates after the fact. Thank you uh, for that response. Uh, here's another question that, that I think is in some ways related to the comments that, that you've just made. Well, you know, I, I, I think creating incentives to get people to, well, or to get campaigns um, and to get candidates to reach out I, I, it assumes something huge, and that is that it is in the interest of any particular candidate or campaign to reach out to a number of people. Um, I, I think looking at it cynically, it would seem to be the case that uh, it is most efficacious to not have some people uh, participate in the process. And, and in fact, so the next question um, looks specifically at people in Colorado jails. And it says, most people in Colorado jails are eligible to vote and are poor people. Who has an interest in engaging those, those voters? Yeah, a very uh, important question. Uh, cynically, you may, the answer may be nobody. Um, if we're not committed to a political community that's inclusive and diverse and representative, then nobody. If you don't think that that community of voters is gonna help tip the scales to help you win, it may be too small, mm -hmm. or it may be that you believe that by going to jail, you've done something that eliminates your ability to participate and you just don't wanna reach out to those communities, then nobody has an incentive. But the question says, who has an interest in engaging these voters? People who are committed to representative democracy, that's who. Now, are we able to elevate the desire 
for a stable representative democracy above the other issues that we care about the most? Is this more important to you than police reform? Is this more important to you than infrastructure funding? Is this more important to you than abortion rights? And for some of you out there, you may say yes. And for others, you may say, well, maybe on some of those, but not others. But until sustaining a stable representative democracy is the core, most foundational argument that you're willing to sacrifice other issues for, then clever, cynical politicians are just going to throw democracy into the bin of issues that they're dealing with as just one of many. And that's what we're seeing, I think, with the Republican Party, at least at the national level of leadership. They've said it's in our interest to kind of leave things vague uh, because people aren't, willing, aren't going to turn, leave our party on that issue. They may, may leave our party on a different issue. And until we can get people committed to Republican or, excuse me, representative democracy as the most important issue, even if that means supporting candidates who we disagree with on other issues, at least to keep that baseline, then we're at real risk. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question that I have. I mean, and it occurred to me uh, during your slide presentation when you were referencing uh, various provisions of the US Constitution that uh, supported non-discrimination. And you mentioned, for example, gender discrimination. And I assume that you were uh, referencing uh, the provision that gave women the right to vote. Um, and, and I guess the first thing I thought was, well, one of the big complaints about the US Constitution, and, and I'm one of those complainers, is that we really don't have what I would consider to be a pervasive uh, gender non-discrimination uh, ethos, at least not one that's been directly articulated, or I think even very clearly interpreted uh, by US constitutional jurisprudence over the generations. So for example, while I think it's fairly common for us to say that racial discrimination, for example, would get the highest level of scrutiny, I don't think that's ever quite been the case and with when it comes to gender. And so I'm wondering, and also given the fact that increasingly in recent years, we see that women are, are being significant political actors. Do you think, for example, if we were to pass the Equal Rights Amendment or some other amendment to the Constitution that clearly articulated uh, gender rights, would that enhance the voting uh, rights or situation for women? Or, or do we even need that, um, given what have been your studies of voting patterns? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> It is a really good question because typically you think if we've amended the constitution, it reflects the will of a large community in the country that we've had a new culture develop around the protection of rights that led to a constitutional amendment. Um, on the other hand, we've seen explicit words in the constitution really have no practical meaning, right? There is a protection in the 15th amendment that you cannot discriminate against voting based on race or previous condition of servitude. Man, we spent a hundred years ignoring that language and that's right baked into the constitution. And there's even strong jurisprudential ties to this idea of strict scrutiny, at least since the 1940s. And yet there was still strong discrimination on race, let alone gender, which didn't have such an explicit uh, language. That being said, I will note that in his majority opinion in Rucho versus Common Cause, this is the partisan gerrymandering case that Chief Justice Roberts authored. He said, one of the reasons we don't think the courts are going to get involved in this particular dispute is because there's not clear language from Congress or the Constitution that suggests there's a direction that we need to go. He seems to suggest if Congress passed a bill that said elections shall be free, that that would be enough of a hook for the federal courts to, to glom onto. Why? Because he says, go to, go to state court. They're open. And state courts, you have a claim because the state Constitution says elections shall be free. So despite kind of some historical counter arguments, I do think there's been some signals from the current court that if there were some more clear articulated literary kind of textual hooks, there would be a willingness in the court to engage on some of these issues in the ways that they haven't in the past. I think the ERA is one example. I think the ERA uh, being passed would lead to strict scrutiny or something closer to it for gender. Of course, that's a double-edged sword. If we continue this anti-classification view of these amendments instead of you know, anti-insubordination, but yeah. still, I think that that would lead the courts to have a much stronger view because they would see a signal from the political branches, we take this right seriously. And so I do think that a, a constitutional amendment or a statement from Congress that we think voting is a fundamental right, explicitly stated, could tip the scales in certain cases. And I say that as somebody who's not very optimistic 
about the Roberts Court's views on voting rights in any way, promoting expanded voting rights or protecting against kind of democratic rule. But I do think it would make a big difference. Thank you. Now, here's a question that uh, seems to turn things around a, a little bit. Uh, I, I think the general theme of your presentation and your comments have, has been, if I'm going to simplify it, that it is a good thing to expand voting rights um, and access to democracy, assuming that voting um, is a real sort of core value of democracy. It's a good thing to expand those rights. Um, but the question we have is, how far are we obligated to go to ensure that we maximize turnout? Uh, and it goes on to say, what are some limits on making voting as easy as possible that you would support? Meaning this question sort of presumes that there is a dark side uh, to making uh, voting easily, if not broadly accessible uh, for more people. Absolutely. This is a, a question from Professor Griffin. So thank you so much uh, for that question. Um, I didn't start... want to name him, but go ahead. I know. Well, that, I, I, well, I've learned more from his work than he'll ever learn from my work, and I uh, respect him so much as a scholar. So this question is, I, I take it, it's a very meaningful question, actually. Um, how, how far are we obligated to go to ensure that we maximize turnout? I'm going to start there before I answer the, the more provocative question, which is, what do I support? Because <laughs> before I undermine myself, let me give some thoughts about this. Because uh, the, que the, the question is correct. Um, we could create technology that puts a, a microchip in our brain and reads our thoughts, and then you'd never have to show up to vote. You just know what you're thinking at all times. Okay, so maybe that's too extreme. So we take the microchip out, but we have somebody come to your door and, and, and hold your hand and, and fill out the ballot every four years. That's probably extreme. So yes, in the, in the, very, in the limits of voting rights, um, you can imagine that voting is never going to be as easy as physically or technologically possible. And this gets a little bit to Justice Alito's argument in Brnovich. There are just natural inconveniences to voting. There has to be a, a polling station somewhere. And it has to be located in physical space, which means for some people it will be further away and for other people it will be closer. And some of those quote unquote inconveniences are inevitable and need to be tolerated. And so there becomes a line drawing exercise. At what point do we draw a line where we think we've gone too far? Um, I started out the talk by saying, I would much rather engage in this debate. I would much rather us accept that voting is a fundamental and universal right, and then debate as to who deserves to be excluded from the population. And Professor Griffin and I may disagree about the extent, but I think it's at least the right debate to be having as opposed to trying to justify these expansions that are clunky and that two steps forward, three steps back sometimes that haven't really progressed in the way that we may want. And so at least change, I think this is the right way to change the conversation. The question is to flip it around and say, how far are we willing to go? Um, so what are some limits that, would, that I would support on making voting as easy as possible? Um, I certainly would support election day registration. I think that creating an extra burden for people to vote has not proven to be necessary to prevent fraud. Uh, it hasn't been necessary for administrative purposes, and it has led to decreased turnout in communities. And we've seen some evidence, not perhaps as strong as um, advocates may like, that moving to election day or same day registration has increased turnout or made the electorate uh, more representative. Um, I would say, I wouldn't in a vacuum argue that mail-in voting is the definite way to run an election because I think we lose something when we, when we do mail-in voting. I think you lose the chance to go down and have a community moment and celebrate and visit your neighbors and be in the space and fill out the, the ballot and get a sticker and put it in the machine. And there is something very tactile, I think that's meaningful. But I will say that recent political science scholarship has looked specifically at Colorado and has shown that our system of mail-in voting has resulted in an electorate that participates and that looks more representative of the, under, of the overall state's population than other forms of voting. And if that's true, like taking away starting an election system in a vacuum, but if that's true, that that would move us closer to a representative system, then I would support mail-in voting as a universal practice. So what I would support making voting at least moving away from the status quo in directions that expand the electorate in a representative way. Now, that may not mean that the total number of voters will increase, but at least the voters who turn out are more reflective of the overall population. That would be a major uh, win in my book. And I have to say the scholarship right now is, is suggesting that mail-in voting is the way to go. And I would not have advocated for that maybe as recently as three or four years ago. So 
that those would be two of the biggest reforms that I would support. Thank you. That that is that's fascinating. I, I, we could go on all night. I'm I'm going to try to contain myself uh, because your your comment just gave me probably half a dozen other questions. Um, we do have another question in the queue. Um, that is uh, Stacey Abrams pushed a strategy of reaching out to people with a weak history of voting. Was her campaign successful in actually turning out those voters? And if so, has that success incentivized other Democratic campaigns to do the same? So it's asking basically. Was uh, Abrams' efforts, were they successful ultimately, and are they a model uh, for other Democratic campaigns, or, or indeed maybe for any uh, campaign? Uh, absolutely. So what sta the reason why Stacey Abrams has been uh, like a mini rock star in the voting rights community is because of this specific campaign that she's had in Georgia to contact voters who have never been contacted before. Poor people living in condos that, you know, you normally ignore because they're transient. They're not going to be around. She says, no, 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 no. They're here. They're listening. They need to be heard. And as it turns out, you go and ask them to vote. They turn out to vote. And so her campaign has been widely, widely successful. And I think that's one of the reasons why she performed well in her state's gubernatorial campaign, why she's maintained a presence on the national scene, because people see what she's doing as a model. Now, why isn't it being modeled more? Because it is dang hard. And it is darn expensive. You've got to employ more canvassers. You've got to go into harder neighborhoods. You've got to knock on more doors. There's going to be less people home. It's not efficient. It's not the kind of efficiency that campaigns want, where they say, I'm just going to go to these places. I know people are home. They're going to vote for me. But she's shown it can work. And if campaigns really you know, ultimately care about at the end winning, and she's shown that Democrats have been able to be successful in a state that's not only been red for a long time, but actually still retains a Republican majority in its state legislature, its congressional um, caucus, its, its governor's house, despite having two Democratic senators because of the special circumstances of that January special election. She has shown that you can do that and move the needle in the direction of your cause. Republicans should be doing the same thing. I think they could move the needle in favor of their cause too if they ask people to vote for them. But she, the short answer is yes. Um, she people need to listen and to look at her roadmap for how to run campaigns because it has shown on these maps, like the Catalyst data maps, you can see more contact among people who are less likely to turn out and more turnout for first time voters in these Georgia races than we've seen in other states. Thank you. And we are getting close to time. However, we do have one more question. Uh, well, it looked pretty intriguing. It says in some countries, and uh, this uh, questioner has Brazil in mind, election days are somewhat of a holiday. Voting is compulsory and poll workers are drafted like our jurors are drafted. Is a national voting holiday or mandatory voting strategies uh, to help mobilize democratic voice, little d uh, democratic. Um, is this feasible under the US constitution and are these even desirable methodologies, do you think? Feasible, yes. Desirable, absolutely. Likely to happen or plausible, no. Not in our current environment. Nothing's more American than saying, I don't wanna do something that's good for me. This is like the story of the last two years. This is what makes us like true Americans. We have the right to do whatever we want. So it makes us true something. <laughs> yes. So I don't want to vote. There's nothing more American saying I don't want to vote. Of course, there are ways around that. You can have a bubble that says I hate politics and you force people to show up to vote and they can check that bubble. Uh, and, and we've seen that in other countries that have mandatory voting. But certainly, um, you know, there's concerns about voting being election uh, holiday because if you make it a Tuesday, people worry about the workday, people taking weekends off, all these I consider pointless and frankly, silly arguments. It's a symbol, it's a signal that we take this seriously. We take voting seriously. We want you to vote. You still have the option to vote or not vote. Um, the, the Freedom to Vote Act that has been introduced in Congress, but was uh, filibustered from debate this last week, it provides for a national voting holiday. That's something I just can't imagine people wouldn't want to get behind. Um, but but they haven't. I think it is desirable. And it, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that would forbid compulsory voting or that would forbid uh, a holiday for voting and, or that would forbid drafting election workers like we do jurors to, for their civic duty. But it's um, expanding the electorate, which used to be more of a common ground type of an idea, has become itself very partisan. And so right now, if Democrats aren't willing to push it through because they are the party that's supporting it at the current moment, it hasn't always been that way, but at the current moment, then it seems very unplausible. 
Thank you so much, Professor Spencer. Um, we've come to the end of our, our program. So uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, Professor. This, this presentation has just been informative, dynamic. Uh, honestly, I, I, I'm sure that many of our viewers would agree that we could just go on for another couple of hours um, with this fascinating presentation. Um, and with that, I also want to thank all of you for joining us and engaging in this meaningful conversation. Uh, next week, you will obtain a link to the recording of the presentation um, and also a survey so that you can share with us your thoughts um, about the program. Um, also, uh, Colorado attorneys, um, you will also get a link for CLE uh, affidavit for those of you seeking CLE credit. Um, and with that, I bid you all a good night. And once again, thank you so very much for participating. This has been a pleasure to be with you all. Thanks so much. And thanks again, Professor Spencer. Thank you.